The typical Nigerian government places no priority on the people. True or false? My thesis is that good governance is a treasure that we are yet to discover in Nigeria. And there are two possible avenues to that discovery. One is by sheer chance or miracle, which could happen next year or in a million years, but with no certainty. The second avenue is by the deliberate decision of Nigerians to become conscious citizens, active patriots, determined to whip their governments into line. But let us frame the dysfunction. It is important to paint a vivid picture because while many of our countrymen and women are aware that things have gone awry, we're still under the illusion that somehow we can keep managing. So let's frame the dysfunction with a few of our notorious distinctions. We have the global award for the highest number of school aid children that are out of school. It's recently moved from 10.5 million to 13.5 million. And this is a UNICEF estimate. We are the petroleum pollution capital of the world with over a thousand spills, oil spills, happening every year. Fantastical corruption elevated to national culture. The minimum wage debate going on at the moment, equivalent of $50 per month as minimum wage. And the governors are opposed to an increase to a miserable equivalent of $100 a month. But that is not the worst story. The sector that shows us more than anything else how bad things are is the security sector, security of life. And it's occurred to me that if we lay one body at a time of all the lives that have been lost to extrajudicial or avoidable killings, both by state actors and non-state actors, we might just be able to frame along, frame around the entire 4,900 kilometers boundary length of Nigeria with skeletons. So picture that in your mind, a country whose boundary length is framed around with skeletons. But how is that possible? Do the body count? Mass casualties from Boko Haram. Header farmer fatalities. Pensioners who drop dead because their gratuities are denied them. Twelve years ago, 61 young angels, many of them would have been in this hall today, and they would have been in various professions. But we lost them to different levels of needlessness in the Sosolito crash of 2000 and six. And there are many more. How about the young applicants who paid 1,000 naira each to go for an immigration job screening only to die in the process of that screening because it wasn't properly organized. And only a few days ago, five young law graduates died in a motor accident because about 5,000 
law graduates are required to travel to Abuja in the world of 2018 to do screening before they have to travel back home and come back again later for their call to bar. Screening, pre-call to bar screening in the world of 2018. So this is the level of the dysfunction. And if you can see, I don't know if the screen is showing. So you can see, not to, not to talk of the youths in the Niger Delta that have been extinguished by the Nigerian military in the last maybe 20 years or so, from Kayama to Baramatu to Odi invasion, Umuechem, Ogoni land. But the dysfunction cuts across the spectrum. In a market-led economy, which is what our country is striving to be, the biggest business of government is to regulate the market operators in a way that ensures fairness and protection for all stakeholders for the public. But the question is, the Nigerian government, whether at the executive levels or at the legislative levels, as regulators of the markets, are they sleeping or are they sold out? And the best sector to illustrate this to us is the oil and gas sector. So you have a situation where for 40 years, every single day for 40 years, contaminant discharge of crude oil production, from crude oil production, is discharged into the host community, Brass Kingdom, the host community of one of the oil companies, every single day for 40 years. And the regulators are shamelessly looking away. In another case, a major oil producer started a massive exploration campaign and there, was an ex and there was an explosion of the rig, the production facility that was being used for that campaign. But the interesting thing is that there was no environmental impact assessment that was conducted before that campaign started. And that explosion was, the, was Nigeria's own version of the American US, the US Deep Water Horizon, Gulf of Mexico explosion of 2010, which when it happened, President Barack Obama personally led the charge, sleeves rolled up, went to the scene four times and ensured that BP and the other companies that worked with it, with it paid the right compensations, did immediate cleanup, and were duly sanctioned. From 2010 till date, over $60 billion have been spent on civil, comp civil fines, criminal fines, compensations, and cost of remediation. But in our own case, where that rig, quite similar to Deepwater Horizon happened, and without a prior environmental impact assessment, no real sanctions have been visited on the company till date. But in this family of scenarios, the one I find most interesting is that about 40 years ago, in 1978, a host community wrote to an oil service company to come and evacuate a major oil production platform that 
was bought. The company very kindly wrote back to, that is the discharge of 40 years into Brass Kingdom every single day as we speak today. Today's discharge is continuing and it flows into the Brass River. But back to this community that wrote to the oil service company to evacuate the bond platform. And the company wrote back, that's the platform, the company wrote back to the community to say, you know what? We have left that platform for you as gratification for your hospitality while we were here. And that is the letter. So this is the kind of dysfunction. And these sorts of things can only happen, I say, in societies where there are either no governments or there are no citizens or there is none of both. Two more examples, just for saturation effect. So for two years in Port Harcourt, two gentlemen, Eugene Abels and Tunde Bello, have been leading a campaign to stop the suit. And you can see that the priority of governments from Brick House in Port Harcourt to Assault Rock in Abuja, there are no listening ears. More priority is placed on jamborees and on trading blames over saving lives. And then in 2012, you all remember the mega flood that came. But this year, up till just a few days ago, the 2018 flood came to remind us that government doesn't care. So we live in a society where folks are now forced to embark on self-help, to rely only on self-help. And that is a very good thing about our society. It is good. It shows a level of resilience. Because when the 2018 floods came, a group of Ijo women under the platform Ijo Women Connect and some Ijo youths got together with literally hundreds of thousands of naira and bought relief materials, went into the heart of the floods and started showing some level of compassion. And it is only after they went that governments and big companies started to go. But till date, there is no flood master plan. So the question is, can we continue to rely on this kind of self-help, individualistic, first aid, self-help? And I say that self-help is good, but it has to be collective self-help. The self-help where we ginger ourselves as citizens, remind ourselves to become conscious citizens, active patriots, because patriotism is not an idle concept. Patriotism implies a conscious, active effort to do the right thing or to ensure that the right thing is done. In America, there's a notion that all leaders are patriots and that they may only differ in methods. But that is political correctness that is a luxury for us in Nigeria. 20 years after the return to civil rule and seeing the quality of governance that we have had, equal opportunity, bad governance between the parties, I think it is time for Nigerians to insist that the presumption must change and that we must reverse and reframe our loyalties. We can't be loyal to the politicians. The politicians must be loyal to us. And we must 
challenge our governments and our political tribe to understand that we do not presume them to be patriots. They have to prove to us the presumption of patriotism is broken. So when you get into office, you have to prove to us that you are a patriot. But that depends on us as a people. And so what is the way forward? The way forward, we have given examples of the self-help in the flood situation, the self-help in Port Harcourt, where two gentlemen are leading a campaign to end the suit. But we must take it to a higher level. We must scale up. And so my advocacy is for what I call a citizen movement. And for us to have a citizen movement, we must redefine civil society. We have to redefine organized civil society in Nigeria in order to, we have to re reinvent civil society in order to reframe our society. So that citizen movement will start by way of existing groups and even new groups coming together, civil society organizations coming together and taking the responsibility to curate a national dialogue, a conversation that compels everyone sitting in this room and everyone else in the country to start to take an active interest in the affairs around him, so that you don't wait until it happens to you before you know that the bell tolls for you also. So a citizen movement led by civil society, but civil society that has to reinvent itself. Because in the build-up to the return to civil rule in 1999, power was on the streets. Pro-democracy forces worked together to push the military out. And so power was practically on the streets. But authentic pro-democracy minds were not strategic enough to organize and take that power. And so the power returned to the same ruling class that had shared its military skin and put on the civilian skin. 20 years on, it is time for civil society, authentic pro-democracy minds, to challenge themselves, indeed challenge ourselves, to reclaim our country and our future. But there is one serious deficiency with civil society, and that is that most non-governmental organizations, most civil society organizations in Nigeria are funded by foreign donors only. For civil society to be a strong force and make the change that we seek. So a, the idea sim sounds simple enough, but there's a lot of work to do, which means that we must restructure, reorient, and then also recreate funding strategies. There must be crowdfunding strategies, domestic crowdfunding strategies. So if you and I are contributing, making contributions, funding these platforms, then we have a sense of stakeholdership. We have a sense of ownership. We are not depending only on DFID, USAID, and foreign, other foreign donors. Their donations are still welcome, but we must take ownership in our civil society platforms so that you then have a network of assemblies that can create a national conversation, a national dialogue, a live national dialogue that is not left only to government. And that assembly, that network of assemblies and of civil society organizations, now with a mass membership base of Nigerians, whether in the villages or in urban centers, can through the national dialogue, over a period of time, produce 
a Nigeria Citizen Compact. What do I mean by the Nigeria Citizen Compact? A document, a living document that will reflect the true aspirations of Nigerians, not waiting for government to do it. That citizen movement can eventually even become something of a shadow government, all within the context of the rule of law, all within the existing legal order. So nothing unlawful, nothing illegal, but that citizen movement can eventually become a shadow government that puts both the ruling parties and the opposition parties on their toes. Because from our experience, we find that we neither have competent ruling parties nor consensus opposition parties. There's got to be an alternative. And we have to be the ones to create that alternative. So the document that will come out of that dialogue process, that national conversation, will be one that sets specific directive standards for leadership behavior, for qualitative governance. So for example, why would our presidents and our ministers and our governors tell us how they want to create, they want to turn our country and our states into tourism destinations. But when they take a vacation, they don't spend it at home. They go abroad to spend their vacation. So a document like that, that citizen compact, will be so specific that it can say, for example, that we require our leaders to spend at least 30% or 50% of their vacation at home. And we insist that our leaders in public positions cannot spend more than a certain amount of their time in office outside their official stations. We can no longer continue to have governors who spend 50% of their time out of the state. And when they are not in the state, the entire state is sleeping. It may sound difficult, it may sound like it is not doable, but I have news for you. A group of thought leaders in a part of the Niger Delta came together recently and they have been working on just such an idea. The two groups leading that effort are Ijo Elders Forum and a group named Ambassador Foundation. And the product of the collaboration just yet is a draft of possibly the first public governance code in Nigeria. And it is called the Code of Ethics, Leadership, and Governance. The devil may be in the detail, but trust me, if we put our minds to it, the angels may join us on the journey. Thank you.